Print carts and garage door openers. What's next? Copyrighted light fixtures. Even in the context of legitimate, excuse me. Traditional, copyrighted works like movies on DVDs, anti-circumvention is bad news. Copyright is a delicate balance. It gives creators and their assignees some rights, but it also reserves some rights to the public. For example, an author has no right to prohibit anyone from transcoding his books into assistive formats for the blind. More importantly, though, a creator has a very limited say over what you can do once you lawfully acquire her works. If I buy your book, your painting, or your DVD, it belongs to me. It's my property. Not my intellectual property, a wacky kind of pseudo-property that's Swiss cheesed with exceptions, easements and limitations, but real. No fooling, actual tangible property, the kind of thing that courts have been managing through property law for centuries. But antiserumvention lets rights holders invent new and exciting copyrights for themselves, to write private laws without accountability or deliberation, that expropriate your interest in your physical property to their favor. Region-coded DVDs are an example of this. There's no copyright here or in anywhere I know of that says that an author should be able to control where you enjoy her creative works, once you've paid for them. I can buy a book and throw it in my bag and take it anywhere from Toronto to Timbuktu, and read it wherever I am. I can even buy books in America and bring them to the UK, where the author may have an exclusive distribution deal with a local publisher who sells them for double the US shelf price. When I'm done with it. I can sell it on or give it away in the UK. Copyright lawyers call this first sale, but it may be simpler to think of it as capitalism. The keys to decrypt a DVD are controlled by an org called DVDCCA, and they have a bunch of licensing requirements for anyone who gets a key from them. Among these is something called region coding, if you buy a DVD in France, it'll have a flag set that says. I am a European DVD, bring that DVD to America and your DVD player will compare the flag to its list of permitted regions, and if they don't match, it will tell you that it's not allowed to play your disc. Remember, there is no copyright that says that an author gets to do this. When we wrote the copyright statutes and granted authors the right to control display, performance, duplication, derivative works, and so forth, we didn't leave out geography by accident. That was on purpose. So when your French DVD won't play in America, that's not because it'd be illegal to do so. It's because the studios have invented a business model and then invented a copyright law to prop it up. The DVD is your property and so is the DVD player, but if you break the region coding on your disc, you're going to run afoul of anti-circumvention. That's what happened to John Johansson, a Norwegian teenager who wanted to watch French DVDs on his Norwegian DVD player. He and some pals wrote some code to break the CSS so that he could do so. He's a wanted man here in America, in Norway the studios put the local fuzz up to bringing him up on charges of asterisk unlawfully trespassing upon a computer system, asterisk when his defense asked. Which computer has John trespassed upon, the answer was. His own. His no fooling, real and physical property has been expropriated by the weird, notional, metaphorical intellectual property on his DVD. DRM only works if your record player becomes the property of whomever's records you're playing. Dash dot. 3. DRM systems are bad for biz. This is the worst of all the ideas embodied by DRM, that people who make record players should be able to spec whose records you can listen to, and that people who make records should have a veto over the design of record players. We've never had this principle, in fact. We've always had just the reverse. Think about all the things that can be plugged into a parallel or serial interface, which were never envisioned by their inventors. Our strong economy and rapid innovation are byproducts of the ability of anyone to make anything that plugs into anything else, from the Flow B electric razor that snaps onto the end of your vacuum hose to the octopus spilling out of your car's dashboard lighter socket, standard interfaces that anyone can build for are what makes billionaires out of nerds. The courts affirm this again and again. It used to be illegal to plug anything that didn't come from AT&T into your phone jack. They claimed that this was for the safety of the network, but really it was about propping up this little penny anti-racket that AT&T had in charging you a rental fee for your phone until you'd paid for it a thousand times over. 
When that ban was struck down, it created the market for third-party phone equipment, from talking novelty phones to answering machines to cordless handsets to headsets. Billions of dollars of economic activity that had been suppressed by the closed interface. Note that AT&T was one of the big beneficiaries of this, they also got into the business of making phone kit. DRM is the software equivalent of these closed hardware interfaces. Robert Scoble is a softie who has an excellent blog, where he wrote an essay about the best way to protect your investment in the digital music you buy. Should you buy Apple iTunes Music, or Microsoft DRM Music? Scoble argued that Microsoft's music was a sounder investment, because Microsoft would have more downstream licensees for its proprietary format and therefore you'd have a richer ecosystem of devices to choose from when you were shopping for gizmos to play your virtual records on. What a weird idea, that we should evaluate our record purchases on the basis of which recording company will allow the greatest diversity of record players to play its discs. That's like telling someone to buy the Betamax instead of the Edison Kinetoscope because Thomas Edison is a crank about licensing his patents, all the while ignoring the world's relentless march to the more open VHS format. It's a bad business. DVD is a format where the guy who makes the records gets to design the record players. Ask yourself. How much innovation has there been over the past decade of DVD players? They've gotten cheaper and smaller, but where are the weird and amazing new markets for DVD that were opened up by the VCR? There's a company that's manufacturing the world's first HDD-based DVD jukebox, a thing that holds 100 movies, and they're charging asterisk $27 asterisk for this thing. We're talking about a few thousand dollars worth of components, all that other cost is the cost of anti-competition. Dash dot. Four. DRM systems are bad for artists. But what of the artist? The hard-working filmmaker, the ink-stained scribbler, the heroin-cured leathery rock star. We poor slobs of the creative class are everyone's favorite poster children here. The RIAA and MPAA hold us up and say. Won't someone please think of the children, file sharers say. Yeah, we're thinking about the artists, but the labels are the man, who cares what happens to you. To understand what DRM does to artists, you need to understand how copyright and technology interact. Copyright is inherently technological, since the things it addresses, copying, transmitting, and so on, are inherently technological. The piano roll was the first system for cheaply copying music. It was invented at a time when the dominant form of entertainment in America was getting a talented pianist to come into your living room and pound out some tunes while you sang along. The music industry consisted mostly of sheet music publishers. The player piano was a digital recording and playback system. Piano roll companies bought sheet music and ripped the notes printed on it into zeros and ones on a long roll of computer tape, which they sold by the thousands, the hundreds of thousands, the millions. They did this without a penny's compensation to the publishers. They were digital music pirates. ARRRR. Predictably, the composers and music publishers went nutso. Souza showed up in Congress to say that. These talking machines are going to ruin the artistic development of music in this country. When I was a boy. In front of every house in the summer evenings, you would find young people together singing the songs of the day or old songs. Today you hear these infernal machines going night and day. We will not have a vocal cord left. The vocal cord will be eliminated by a process of evolution, as was the tale of man when he came from the ape. The publishers asked Congress to ban the piano roll and to create a law that said that any new system for reproducing music should be subject to a veto from their industry association. Lucky for us. Congress realized what side of their bread had butter on it and decided not to criminalize the dominant form of entertainment in America. But there was the problem of paying artists. The Constitution sets out the purpose of American copyright, to promote the useful arts and sciences. The composers had a credible story that they'd do less composing if they weren't paid for it, so Congress needed a fix. Here's what they came up with, anyone who paid a music publisher two cents would have the right to make one piano roll of any song that publisher published. The publisher couldn't say no and no one had to hire a lawyer at $200 an hour to argue about whether the payment should be two cents or a nickel. 
This compulsory license is still in place today, when Joe Cocker sings with a little help from my friends, he pays a fixed fee to the Beatles publisher and away he goes, even if Ringo hates the idea. If you ever wondered how Sid Vicious talked Anka into letting him get a crack at my way, well, now you know. That compulsory license created a world where a thousand times more money was made by a thousand times more creators who made a thousand times more music that reached a thousand times more people. This story repeats itself throughout the technological century, every 10 or 15 years. Radio was enabled by a voluntary blanket license, the music companies got together and asked for a consent decree so that they could offer all their music for a flat fee. Cable TV took a compulsory. The only way cable operators could get their hands on broadcasts was to pirate them and shove them down the wire, and Congress saw fit to legalize this practice rather than screw around with their constituents' TVs. Sometimes, the courts and Congress decided to simply take away a copyright, that's what happened with the VCR. When Sony brought out the VCR in 1976. The studios had already decided what the experience of watching a movie in your living room would look like. They'd licensed out their programming for use on a machine called a Discovision, which played big LP-sized discs that were read-only. Proto-DRM. The copyright scholars of the day didn't give the VCR very good odds. Sony argued that their box allowed for a fair use, which is defined as a use that a court rules as a defense against infringement based on four factors, whether the use transforms the work into something new, like a collage, whether it uses all or some of the work, whether the work is artistic or mainly factual, and whether the use undercuts the creator's business model. The Betamax failed on all four fronts, when you time-shifted or duplicated a Hollywood movie off the air, you made a non-transformative use of 100% of a creative work in a way that directly undercut the Discovision licensing stream. Jack Valenti, the mouthpiece for the motion picture industry, told Congress in 1982 that the VCR was to the American film industry as the Boston Strangler is to a woman home alone. But the Supreme Court ruled against Hollywood in 1984, when it determined that any device capable of a substantial non-infringing use was legal. In other words, we don't buy this Boston Strangler business, if your business model can't survive the emergence of this general purpose tool. It's time to get another business model or go broke. Hollywood found another business model, as the broadcasters had, as the vaudeville artists had, as the music publishers had, and they made more art that paid more artists and reached a wider audience. There's one thing that every new art business model had in common, it embraced the medium it lived in. This is the overweening characteristic of every single successful new medium, it is true to itself. The Luther Bible didn't succeed on the axes that made a hand copied monk Bible valuable, they were ugly, they weren't in church Latin, they weren't read aloud by someone who could interpret it for his lay audience, they didn't represent years of devoted with a capital D labor by someone who had given his life over to God. The thing that made the Luther Bible a success was its scalability, it was more popular because it was more proliferate, all success factors for a new medium pale beside its profligacy. The most successful organisms on Earth are those that reproduce the most, bugs and bacteria, nematodes and vari. Reproduction is the best of all survival strategies. Piano rolls didn't sound as good as the music of a skilled pianist, but they scaled better. Radio lacked the social elements of live performance, but more people could build a crystal set and get it aimed correctly than could pack into even the largest vaudeville house. MP3s don't come with liner notes, they aren't sold to you by a hipper-than-thou record store clerk who can help you make your choice, bad rips and truncated files abound. I once downloaded a 12-second copy of Hey Jude from the original Napster. Yet MP3 is out-competing the CD. I don't know what to do with CDs anymore. I get them, and they're like the especially nice garment bag they give you at the fancy suit shop. It's nice and you feel like a goof for throwing it out, but Christ, how many of these things can you usefully own? I can put 10,000 songs on my laptop, but a comparable pile of discs, with liner notes and so forth, that's a liability. It's a piece of my monthly storage locker costs. Here are the two most important things to know about computers and the internet, 1. A computer is a machine for rearranging bits. 2. The internet is a machine for moving bits from one place to another very cheaply and quickly. Any new medium that takes hold on the internet and with computers will embrace these two facts, not regret them.
A newspaper press is a machine for spitting out cheap and smeary newsprint at speed, if you try to make it output fine art lithos. You'll get junk. If you try to make it output newspapers. You'll get the basis for a free society. And so it is with the internet. At the heyday of Napster, record execs used to show up at conferences and tell everyone that Napster was doomed because no one wanted lossily compressed MP3s with no liner notes and truncated files and misspelled metadata. Today we hear ebook publishers tell each other and anyone who'll listen that the barrier to ebooks is screen resolution. It's bollocks, and so is the whole sermonette about how nice a book looks on your bookcase and how nice it smells and how easy it is to slip into the tub. These are obvious and untrue things, like the idea that radio will catch on once they figure out how to sell you hot dogs during the intermission, or that movies will really hit their stride when we can figure out how to bring the actors out for an encore when the films run out. Or that what the Protestant Reformation really needs is Luther Bibles with facsimile illumination in the margin and a rent a priest to read aloud from your personal word of God. New media don't succeed because they're like the old media, only better, they succeed because they're worse than the old media at the stuff the old media is good at, and better at the stuff the old media are bad at. Books are good at being paperwhite. High resolution. Low infrastructure, cheap and disposable. Ebooks are good at being everywhere in the world at the same time for free in a form that is so malleable that you can just paste bomb it into your IM session or turn it into a page a day mailing list. The only really successfully publishing, I mean, hundreds of thousands, millions of copies distributed and read, is the bookware scene, where scanned and OCR'd books are distributed on the darknet. The only legit publishers with any success at e-publishing are the ones whose books cross the internet without technological fetter. Publishers like Bain Books and my own. Tor, who are making some or all of their catalogs available in ASCII and HTML and PDF. The hardware-dependent ebooks. The DRM use and copy-restricted ebooks. Their cratering. Sales measured in the tens. Sometimes the hundreds. Science fiction is a niche business, but when you're selling copies by the ten. That's not even a business. It's a hobby. Every one of you has been riding a curve where you read more and more words off of more and more screens every day through most of your professional careers. It's zero sum, you've also been reading fewer words off of fewer pages as time went by, the dinosauric executive who prints his email and dictates a reply to his secretary as info roadkill. Today, at this very second, people read words off of screens for every hour that they can find. Your kids stare at their Game Boys until their eyes fall out. Euro teens ring doorbells with their hypertrophied. SMS twitching thumbs instead of their index fingers. Paper books are the packaging that books come in. Cheap printer binderies like the Internet Bookmobile that can produce a full bleed, four-color, glossy cover, printed spine. Perfect bound book in 10 minutes for a dollar are the future of paper books, when you need an instance of a paper book, you generate one, or part of one, and pitch it out when you're done. I landed at SeaTac on Monday and burned a couple CDs from my music collection to listen to in the rental car. When I drop the car off. I'll leave them behind. Who needs them? Whenever a new technology has disrupted copyright. We've changed copyright. Copyright isn't an ethical proposition. It's a utilitarian one. There's nothing moral about paying a composer tuppence for the piano roll rights. There's nothing immoral about not paying Hollywood for the right to videotape a movie off your TV. They're just the best way of balancing out so that people's physical property rights in their VCRs and phonographs are respected and so that creators get enough of a dangling carrot to go on making shows and music and books and paintings. Technology that disrupts copyright does so because it simplifies and cheapens creation, reproduction and distribution. The existing copyright businesses exploit inefficiencies in the old production, reproduction and distribution system, and they'll be weakened by the new technology. But new technology always gives us more art with a wider reach. That's what tech is for. Tech gives us bigger pies that more artists can get a bite out of. That's been tacitly acknowledged at every stage of the copy fight since the piano roll. When copyright and technology collide. It's copyright that changes. Which means that today's copyright, the thing that DRM nominally props up, didn't come down off the mountain on two stone tablets. It was created in living memory to accommodate the technical reality created by the inventors of the previous generation. 
To abandon invention now robs tomorrow's artists of the new businesses and new reach and new audiences that the internet and the PC can give them. Dash dot. 5. DRM is a bad business move for MSFT. When Sony brought out the VCR, it made a record player that could play Hollywood's records, even if Hollywood didn't like the idea. The industries that grew up on the back of the VCR, movie rentals, home taping, camcorders, even bar mitzvah videographers, made billions for Sony and its cohort. That was good business, even if Sony lost the Betamax VHS format wars, the money on the world with VCR's table was enough to make up for it. But then Sony acquired a relatively tiny entertainment company and it started to massively screw up. When MP3 rolled around and Sony's Walkman customers were clamoring for a solid-state MP3 player. Sony let its music business unit run its show, instead of making a high-capacity MP3 Walkman. Sony shipped its music clips, low-capacity devices that played brain-damaged DRM formats like Real and OpenMG. They spent good money engineering features into these devices that kept their customers from freely moving their music back and forth between their devices. Customers stayed away in droves. Today, Sony is dead in the water when it comes to Walkman. The market leaders are pokey Singaporean outfits like Creative Labs, the kind of company that Sony used to crush like a bug, back before it got borged by its entertainment unit, and PC companies like Apple. That's because Sony shipped a product that there was no market demand for. No Sony customer woke up one morning and said, Damn. I wish Sony would devote some expensive engineering effort in order that I may do less with my music, presented with an alternative. Sony's customers enthusiastically jumped ship. The same thing happened to a lot of people I know who used to rip their CDs to WMA. You guys sold them software that produced smaller. Better sounding rips than the MP3 rippers, but you also fixed it so that the songs you ripped were device locked to their PCs. What that meant is that when they backed up their music to another hard drive and reinstalled their OS something that the spyware and malware wars has made more common than ever, they discovered that after they restored their music that they could no longer play it. The player saw the new OS as a different machine, and locked them out of their own music. There is no market demand for this feature, none of your customers want you to make expensive modifications to your products that make backing up and restoring even harder. And there is no moment when your customers will be less forgiving than the moment that they are recovering from catastrophic technology failures. I speak from experience. Because I buy a new PowerBook every 10 months, and because I always order the new models the day they're announced. I get a lot of lemons from Apple. That means that I hit Apple's three iTunes authorized computers limit pretty early on and found myself unable to play the hundreds of dollars worth of iTunes songs I'd bought because one of my authorized machines was a lemon that Apple had broken up for parts, one was in the shop getting fixed by Apple, and one was my mom's computer. 3.000 miles away in Toronto. If I had been a less good customer for Apple's hardware, I would have been fine. If I had been a less enthusiastic evangelist for Apple's products, if I hadn't shown my mom how iTunes Music Store worked, I would have been fine. If I hadn't bought so much iTunes Music that burning it to CD and re-ripping it and re-keying all my metadata was too daunting a task to consider, I would have been fine. As it was Apple rewarded my trust, evangelism and out-of-control spending by treating me like a crook and locking me out of my own music, at a time when my PowerBook was in the shop, i.e. at a time when I was hardly disposed to feel charitable to Apple. I'm an edge case here, but I'm a leading edge case. If Apple succeeds in its business plans, it will only be a matter of time until even average customers have upgraded enough hardware and bought enough music to end up where I am. You know what I would totally buy. A record player that let me play everybody's records. Right now, the closest I can come to that is an open source app called VLC, but it's clunky and buggy and it didn't come pre-installed on my computer. Sony didn't make a Betamax that only played the movies that Hollywood was willing to permit, Hollywood asked them to do it, they proposed an early, analog broadcast flag that VCRs could hunt for and respond to by disabling recording. Sony ignored them and made the product they thought their customers wanted. I'm a Microsoft customer. Like millions of other Microsoft customers. I want a player that plays anything I throw at it, and I think that you are just the company to give it to me. 
Yes, this would violate copyright law as it stands, but Microsoft has been making tools of piracy that change copyright law for decades now. Outlook. Exchange and MSN are tools that abet wide-scale digital infringement. More significantly, IIS and your caching proxies all make and serve copies of documents without their author's consent, something that, if it is legal today, is only legal because companies like Microsoft went ahead and did it and dared lawmakers to prosecute. Microsoft stood up for its customers and for progress, and won so decisively that most people never even realized that there was a fight. Do it again. This is a company that looks the world's roughest, toughest antitrust regulators in the eye and laughs. Compared to antitrust people, copyright lawmakers are pantywastes. You can take them with your arm behind your back. In Shiva Vaidyanathan's book The Anarchist in the Library, he talks about why the studios are so blind to their customers' desires. It's because people like you and me spent the 80s and the 90s telling them bad science fiction stories about impossible DRM technology that would let them charge a small sum of money every time someone looked at a movie, want to fast forward. That feature costs another penny. Pausing is two cents an hour. The mute button will cost you a quarter. When Mako Analysis issued their report last month advising phone companies to stop supporting Symbian phones, they were just writing the latest installment in this story. Mako says that phones like my P900, which can play MP3s as ringtones, are bad for the cell phone economy, because it'll put the extortionate ringtone sellers out of business. What Mako is saying is that just because you bought the CD doesn't mean that you should expect to have the ability to listen to it on your MP3 player, and just because it plays on your MP3 player is no reason to expect it to run as a ringtone. I wonder how they feel about alarm clocks that will play a CD to wake you up in the morning. Is that strangling the nascent alarm tone market? The phone company's customers want Symbian phones and for now, at least, the phone companies understand that if they don't sell them, someone else will. The market opportunity for a truly capable devices is enormous. There's a company out there charging asterisk $27 asterisk for a DVD jukebox, go and eat their lunch. Steve Jobs isn't going to do it. He's off at the D conference telling studio execs not to release high-def movies until they're sure no one will make a high-def DVD burner that works with a PC. Maybe they won't buy into his BS, but they're also not much interested in what you have to sell. At the broadcast protection discussion group meetings where the broadcast flag was hammered out, the studio's position was. We'll take anyone's DRM except Microsoft's and Philips. When I met with UK broadcast wonks about the European version of the broadcast flag underway at the Digital Video Broadcasters Forum, they told me. Well, it's different in Europe, mostly they're worried that some American company like Microsoft will get their claws into European television. American film studios didn't want the Japanese electronics companies to get a piece of the movie pie, so they fought the VCR. Today, everyone who makes movies agrees that they don't want to let you guys get between them and their customers. Sony didn't get permission. Neither should you. Go build the record player that can play everyone's records. Because if you don't do it, someone else will. Dollar 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 dollar. The DRM Sausage Factory, originally published as a behind-the-scenes look at how DRM becomes law, Information Week. July 11, 2007. Otto von Bismarck quipped. Laws are like sausages, it is better not to see them being made, I've seen sausages made. I've seen laws made. Both pale in comparison to the process by which anti-copying technology agreements are made. This technology, usually called Digital Rights Management DRM, proposes to make your computer worse at copying some of the files on its hard drive or on other media. Since all computer operations involve copying. This is a daunting task, as security expert Bruce Schneier has said. Making bits harder to copy is like making water that's less wet. At root, DRMs are technologies that treat the owner of a computer or other device as an attacker, someone against whom the system must be armored. Like the electrical meter on the side of your house, a DRM is a technology that you possess, but that you are never supposed to be able to manipulate or modify. Unlike the year meter, though, a DRM that is defeated in one place is defeated in all places, nearly simultaneously. That is to say, once someone takes the DRM off a song or movie or ebook, that freed collection of bits can be sent to anyone else, anywhere the network reaches, in an eye blink. 
DRM crackers need cunning. Those who receive the fruits of their labor need only know how to download files from the internet. Why manufacture a device that attacks its owner? A priori, one would assume that such a device would cost more to make than a friendlier one.